It is so... Um, it is so great to be in Seattle, and I love Seattle. I love Town Hall. You are so fortunate. I mean, not fortunate for tonight. <laughs> you're, for, you're just fortunate to be here and to have this wonderful facility. Uh, I'm here in Seattle this time because of a book. I'm flogging a book. You know what flogging means? Uh, the, the title of this book, I, I've been on the road for two weeks, actually. Uh, I was much taller when I started. Uh, the, t the title of this book has... Uh, well, I was uh, in Cincinnati uh, just a week before last, and uh, several people were offended. They, they said, the title, Saving Capitalism, it sounds like there's something wrong with capitalism. <laughs> you want to save it, but it's perfect. Why are you going to save it? And then, of course, when I got home to Berkeley, A lot of people have been offended. Why, why do you want to save it? <laughs> uh, so my, the title I chose actually has offended everybody, which is sort of a good thing, because if you want to get people riled up and, and talking, you want a title that does that. But the, but the subtitle is actually the most important thing. For the many, not the few. That's what I really wanted to emphasize. And uh, the reason, I'm, I'm going to put this down here, the reason uh, that both those people who are offended because it sounds like I'm critical of capitalism and both those who say, why save it, may not quite get the central issue, which is making the system work for everybody, is because we have been for years involved in a debate that I think is increasingly irrelevant. Uh, and I, I'm, I've been part of the debate. I mean, I, very often I come out and I debate people. I, I debate uh, usually conservatives or Republicans or people who describe themselves that way. And we start debating whatever it is, climate change or education uh, or, I mean, you name it, foreign policy. Uh, it doesn't matter because within about five minutes, the issue comes down to whether do you trust the market more or do you trust government? Or who do you trust least, market or government? And we get into that and I, and I for years, have sort of thought, well, wait a minute, there's something really fundamentally wrong. This, is a, this has to be a distraction from the real issue. Because it's not possible to have a market without government. I mean, if you think about it, there's no, there's no market in a state of nature. It's just uh, survival of the fittest and the biggest. I remember when I was a kid on the playground. That was not a market. <laughs> no, a, a market, uh, is, a mar is, is a mark of civilization in the sense that there are rules. You need rules to have a market. You need rules about even the most basic, fundamental things. What is, what is property? Now, we think we know what property is. What? No, we change our minds collectively about the meaning of property over time. 150 years ago, uh, a lot of people assumed that it was possible to own other people. And we had a big civil war over that definition of property. Uh, now, the most important form of property is intangible property. It's, in fact, it's, it's property that's called intellectual property. And the rules governing intellectual property, what is intellectual property? I mean, can the genome be owned? Class? But you see, all of these rules and the rules governing everything, the basic building blocks of capitalism, a uh, contract uh, and, uh, and property and, and bankruptcy, all of these things we take for granted, but they are constantly being... <laughs> They're constantly being revised and adapted and altered, not only by judges, but also by legislators at the state level, at the federal level, also uh, by administrative agencies. 
without all of this activity by government uh, trying to define and enforce a market, we wouldn't have a market. Mar government creates the market. So when I get into these debates with conservatives over whether I prefer a market or government, and I start thinking this is a profound distraction from something else. What's it a distraction from? It's a, distract it's a distraction from debating what we really ought to be debating, which is, does this system, this government market system, this political economic system, is it working for most of us or is it not working for most of us? And if it's not working for most of us, why isn't it working for most of us? Who is it, who is it working for and why is it working for them and not for most of us? That's what we ought to be debating, but we're not debating it. You know, very often I, I go through airports, as I did uh, this morning, coming into Seattle, uh, and people who I don't know, complete strangers, come up to me. And uh, this morning, uh, uh, I was passing, I was, I, was, I was coming out of the gate, and somebody came up to me, I didn't, I didn't know who she was. She said to me, can you believe it? Now, I think the reason people come up to me who I don't know is that I'm rather conspicuous. Uh, because last week, uh, I, I, again, I was coming out of Cincinnati, and somebody, a, a fellow who I had never seen before, uh, came up to me and he said, what's going to happen? <laughs> now, I want you to put yourself in my place. I mean, you're walking through places, airports, public places, and people are coming up. About three weeks ago, somebody said, what are we going to do? <laughs> now, I have decided that actually what all of this is, and it's been going on, it's actually been increasing over the last year, but it's, it's kind of my own version of a free-floating focus group. And what people are doing when they're coming up to me and saying, they're saying, can you believe it, or what's going to happen, or, or what, what are we going to do, or how, is it getting, how, how did it get this bad, or whatever, uh, these, this, is, this is people simply expressing a lot of anxiety and worry. And they're not specifically focusing on one aspect of this political economic system. Uh, they're talking more generally to themselves, or to me, or however they're talking. And what they're actually saying, I've come to understand, is there is something profoundly wrong. Whether it's that our democracy isn't working, or the economy isn't working, there's something profoundly wrong. They know this, most people, and if you go to opinion polls, official opinion polls, you see the same thing. Increasingly, people sense that the system is not working. Now part of that gradual dawning understanding is that most people know that even at this point in the economic recovery, and we're in, we, we are, since 2009, we've been in a recovery. <laughs> Truly, we have been in a recovery. Uh, by, what I mean by a recovery is that we, we, we hit bottom uh, in 2008, 2009, and we've been, we've been getting better. You see, all of you are looking incredulous. <laughs> no, I'll tell you why. We've been getting better, but most people do not feel that they've been in an economic recovery. That's the reality. In fact, the median wage has barely budged. Household, median household income is actually below what it was in 2009. And sometimes when I talk about the median, uh, people are a little confused because they, somebody said to me recently, well, the average income has gone up, hasn't it? And I say, yes, the average has gone up, but the median hasn't. There's a difference. The basketball player Shaquille O'Neal and I have an average height of six foot two. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you get my drift? You see, the, 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 the people at the top can bring up the average, but that doesn't reflect necessarily where most people are. 
And what has happened over the last, really the last 35 years, but it's only become very apparent to people after the Great Recession started, is that almost all the economic gains have gone to the top. Everybody else has been pretty stagnant. Now, sometimes when I say this, people get very nervous. They, they accuse me of being a class warrior. I am not a class warrior. I'm a class worrier. <laughs> there is a difference. Not just a couple of letters. I worry because the trend that we've been on, which is not, again, just not, it's been apparent the last few years of the recovery, but it's been going on for much longer than that. The trend we're on is not sustainable. It's not sustainable economically because when almost all of the economic gains go to the top, the middle class, which used to be the vast middle class, it still is pretty vast, and the poor don't have enough purchasing power to keep the economy going. And that's one reason this recovery has been so anemic. It's been just about the most anemic recovery on record. What you normally expect, uh, when the economy goes down into the ditch, or into a recession, is that you get a recovery that is sort of the mirror image of how far down the economy went. So that, for example, in 1932, 1933, the economy was in a very, very deep, deep, deep hole, and then in 19, the end of 33, 34, 35, there was a lot of economic growth coming out of that deep, deep trough. So many people naturally predicted that although the 2008 and beginning 2009, ditch was not nearly as deep as 1932, 1933. Uh, still, the assumption was uh, it was deep enough. It was the second deepest trough we've tripped in, we've gone in. There would be a, a fairly strong and brisk recovery, but there wasn't. And one of the main reasons there hasn't been is because the middle class has not had very much purchasing power. You know, see, this goes back to the notion of, of who creates jobs. You know, one of the mythologies that I address in the book, but you need to understand, if you don't already, you probably do, uh, that is uh, CEOs and businesses and Wall Street, they don't create jobs. They are not the job creators. Can I make that absolutely crystal clear? The job creators are people who are buying goods and services, and that's really has been historically the middle class and the poor because they're the ones who spend their money. If all of the money or most of the economic gains go to the top, and this is here, I'm not making an accusation, I'm not blaming anybody, I'm just making an economic truism, stating a truism, I'm not making a truism, <laughs> that if all the gains go to the top, uh, then you know, the people at the top don't spend all of their money, and that's fine. They, they can save it. That's lovely. I'm glad that they can save it, but that doesn't create a lot of economic activity. It doesn't create jobs. Jobs. And so what you want to do is you want to arrange and organize the economy in such a way that you have more widespread prosperity, not only in ethical and moral terms, but also because it keeps the economy going. The other problem with the widening inequality we have had and experienced, and we still are experiencing it, is the people at the top don't just save their money, they also invest it in politics. And I use the word investment advisedly. Because it's not that a lot of people, I'm sure some people, are spending fortunes on politics out of the goodness of their hearts because they just, they feel very strongly about Marco Rubio or whomever. <laughs> Maybe they do, I, I don't know. But, 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 the, but the point I want to make is that, is that many people who have a great deal of money, Aaron, are putting a great deal of money into politics, are not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. They're doing it because they expect a return on that investment. 
Now, a few years ago, when anybody asked me why we are seeing such widening inequality, why we made the big U-turn in America from the 20, 35 years between the Second World War and 1980, when prosperity kept on widening and more and more people partook and took advantage of and, and gained a foothold in the new economy, why we took a, we took a big, big U-turn and then the next 35 years we seem to go in the opposite direction, I would basically attribute the change to two things. One would be globalization. Rarely in history has a word gone so directly from obscurity to meaninglessness without any intervening period of coherence <laughs> as globalization. But what I'm essentially talking about is that, you know, when we globalized, when the United States became more integrated into a global economy, uh, beginning in the late 60s, 1970s, with container ships, cargo ships, satellite communication technology, all of that, inevitably, jobs were outsourced, uh, the production process became parceled out to wherever people could do things most cheaply, and some Americans lost their jobs, or lost good jobs. And I would also talk about technology. Technology and technological change uh, would also displace a lot of people, and those were the two culprits that I always talked about, globalization and technological change. But in recent years, I could not ignore the third big factor which has to do with the ability of big corporations and big Wall Street banks and very wealthy people to get changes in the rules of how the market is organized that benefit them, that enhance their wealth. And you see what happens, you get into a compounding kind of circle, a vicious cycle in which as more and more money from the top becomes relevant in setting the rules, those rules become more and more favorable to the people at the top, and that further enhances their income and their wealth and their ability to fix the rules. Now, that in turn means that if you followed my argument so far, there are a lot of internal, what I might call pre-distributions upward that we don't see, that are inside the market, that most of us actually are redistributing or pre-distributing. I like the word pre-distributing because when we talk about redistributing, that's sort of after all of the market transactions are finished. But the pre-distributions happen inside the market. Let me give you an example. Americans pay more for pharmaceuticals than any citizens of any other rich nation. Now, why do we pay more for pharmaceuticals? Uh, partly we pay more for pharmaceuticals because, for example, the rules, and I want to come back to the rules, the rules of the market, one set of rules says it's perfectly okay in the United States for proprietary drug manufacturers to pay off generic drug manufacturers to delay the introduction of generic versions of the proprietary drugs, even when the patents are finished. That's called pay for delay. That is not legal in most other advanced countries. It is legal here. Why is it legal here? Class. <laughs> it's legal here because those large pharmaceutical companies and a lot of others who have an interest in maximizing the profits of those companies have a lot of influence in the Congress and a lot of influence in terms of shaping the rules of the game. There was a time not long ago when it was possible for seniors, or for anybody for that matter, to buy their pharmaceuticals from Canada. It's much harder to do that now. Why? And we could go on and on. All 
specific rules that are different here than they are in other places. Uh, the government in the United States cannot use, by law, cannot use its huge bargaining leverage with Medicare to get lower drug prices, cannot use that bargaining leverage to negotiate lower drug prices in the United States. Why not? Class? We ought to have a, a repeating cadence. <laughs> but it's almost everywhere you look. Uh, we are paying, you are paying, I'm paying more for internet access than the citizens of any other advanced industrial country, and we're having, we, we get slower internet service than anybody else. Have you, I don't know whether that's true in Seattle, is it? <laughs> well now, that also is what I would call a pre-distribution upward. Pharmaceuticals, the fact that we're paying more, because the, law, because the laws and rules have been tilted in the direction of the pharmaceutical companies, that is really, that's more money out of our paychecks that goes upward to CEOs and to executives and to big shareholders. That is a pre-distribution upward. With regard to internet service, it's exactly the same thing. That's a pre-distribution from our paychecks upward. 80% of Americans have no choice of internet service provider. Now why is that, class? <laughs> or take really almost any industry or almost anything that we would consider to be kind of inevitable, kind of part of the market. Part of the market. The market is just inevitable. The market is doing all of these things. No, the market is not doing all of these things. The five largest Wall Street banks. In 1990, just as I was about to become Secretary of Labor, I was interested in, in, in Wall Street banks and finance. I had been at the Federal Trade Commission, so I was following these things. The five largest Wall Street banks in 1990 had about 10% of all of the banking assets of the United States. Now, if you move forward in time to the year 2000, you find that the five largest banks had by then 25% of all banking assets. And now, today, the five largest banks, remember we've gone through a banking crisis, we had Remember, we had a taxpayer-financed bailout under the rubric called, it was called TARP, T-A-R-P. Never have I heard an acronym that so accurately reflected the hidden, the hidden aspects of something. <laughs> well, today the five largest banks have 44% of all banking assets, which gives them a huge amount of market power which enables them to not only charge more in ways that escape most of our notice, quite frankly, but also at the same time gives them a lot of political power. Have you noticed, for example, that none of the big banks on Wall Street passed the test of whether they could be engaged in an orderly winding down of their operations if they got into trouble. None of them, none of them passed the test. And what was the consequence of none of them passing the test? Nothing. How many bank executives have gone to jail for anything that occurred in 2007 or 8 or 9 or... None. And why is that, class? <laughs> you, see, you see what I'm getting at here. That is, the entire market, instead of, making, instead of thinking of it a choice between market and government, we really have to understand that it is government setting the rules, and the question is, are the rules being set in favor of all of us or in favor of a small number? And is that small number rigging the game in ways that cost us? And the answer is yes. 
Washington is awash in money. I first came to Washington in 1967. I was an intern for Robert F. Kennedy in his Senate office. My job for months was to run his signature machine. <laughs> it was not the most dramatic and exciting or even important job in Washington. Uh, it had, there was a pen at the end of a long wooden kind of a, a arm that was connected to a little motor. And I, my job was to take all of the letters that the secretarial pool, as we called it in those days, had written to all of the constituents of Robert F. Kennedy in New York State uh, under his signature and line them up carefully so that when I turned it on, pressed the button, that Robert F. Kennedy was exactly in the position it needed to be. This was an important, I kept telling myself, <laughs> job. And I was so bored that about two months into the job, I've, I, I actually came into the office. I hate to keep it in this room, if you would, because I, I could get into trouble even now. I, I, I would write letters on his official stationery. I would, I would type them up to my friends. <laughs> Dear Mr. Dworkin, congratulations on having the largest knows in New York State, Robert <laughs> F. Kennedy. You know, they, they, they still have these, they have their frame, my friends have framed <laughs> letters. And then one day, I was, I was standing there in the Senate hallway, and he, Robert F. Kennedy, came out of the bank of elevators right in front of me. I was, I was stunned. I had seen him only rarely. And he was surrounded by his aides, and he stopped for a minute when he saw me. And he said, how's the summer going, Bob? <laughs> Bob? <laughs> he knew my name. I was floored. I, 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 I wanted to say something, but my mouth opened. And I couldn't, I was, but had he asked me at that moment to run his signature machine for the next six months, I would have said yes. <laughs> Washington was an exciting place. It was not necessarily a great time in our nation's history. I mean, the cities were starting to burn. The next year, Martin Luther King was assassinated and Robert Kennedy himself was assassinated. And we were into Vietnam and we were then elected Richard Nixon. These were not great times in America, <laughs> but being in Washington in the middle of some of it, even running a signature machine, I felt was somehow ennobling. And Washington was not a beautiful, rich, restaurant-infested, you know, with thick napkins and heavy silverware. No, in fact, on the rare occasion when somebody from industry wanted to take me out to lunch, uh, I would choose a, a cockroach-infested restaurant on Pennsylvania Avenue, and they would never bother me again, these people. <laughs> it, was a, it was a kind of a... Well, it, it, was, not a, it, it was not a beautiful city, but... It was a city that had its own sense of doing the public's business. In those days, only about 6% of retiring members of Congress went into lobbying. 6%. Today, 50% of retiring members of Congress, regardless of party, go into lobbying. Why the difference? Because there is so much more money to be made. And so the question really becomes, how can we unrig this system? 
I could stand here and give you all sorts of public policies that I think are important public policies. That is not really the issue. We could all agree in this hall, we could all agree on maybe a dozen public policies. We could say, these are good ideas, let's make sure that they are done, but that, even that agreement would not go very far. Because if the moneyed interests are in as much control as they are, even the best public policies are just, are just words. And so I devote the last third of the book to what we do, where we are going and what must happen. And it seems to me almost inevitable that we are on the cusp of, in fact, we may already be living through and not know it. Sometimes these things happen. A change that is very fundamental in our politics. In the book that I wrote, really most of it uh, about a year ago, I said the big division in the future is not going to be tw between Republicans and Democrats or even liberals and conservatives. The big change and the big division in the future is going to be between the establishment and the anti-establishment. That is, between people who have run things for a long time and are in the habit of running things, and people, on the other hand, who don't want things to be run the way they have been, are more, let's use the term, populist. Now, that was long before people like Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump You know, a year ago, I, I, I don't know about you, I, I, like to, I like to think of myself as somebody who understands politics. I've been in and out of politics for most of my adult life. Uh, and I kind of assumed that Hillary Clinton and George, I, I'm sorry, Jeb, <laughs> and Jeb Bush would be, would be uh, shoe-ins, uh, didn't you? I mean, uh, that, that, I mean it, was, it, was, it was even, I was making the argument that there was a certain odd efficiency to it, because we could use all of the old bumper stickers all over again. <laughs> but something is happening. And again, sometimes we don't know it until we look back on it years from now. But all of those people who stop me in airports and say, what are we going to do? All of the people who are sensing that the system is filled with upward pre-distributions. They don't actually see them, but they feel them. They sense them. They feel like the game is rigged. Hillary Clinton, when she started her campaign, I've never heard a presidential campaign start by somebody who said, the, ga the, the deck is stacked in favor of those at the top. Those are the words she actually used. Her husband, in 1992, I was there in Little Rock when he st started his campaign, the idea that he would say anything of that sort would just be out of the question. The interesting thing to me also is that when I talk, and I've been on this book tour now for a couple of weeks, as I said, I've been in Cincinnati and St. Louis and Kansas City and Iowa City, and I've been to places that I don't normally go to sell books. But when I've talked about the importance of busting up the big banks or getting rid of corporate welfare, or getting rid of crony capitalism, or opposing the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Do you know that every one of those issues I just mentioned was overwhelmingly positively greeted by people who told me 
they were conservative Republicans. Something is happening. I am, by nature, very optimistic. I am, I've always been optimistic, but I'm particularly optimistic now. And people, when I say that, people look at me almost cross-eyed. How can I be optimistic when I've just given you a, a bill of particulars about how we're getting more and more unequal, how almost all of the economic gains are going to the top, how we are seeing a vicious cycle in which more and more power is being translated into abilities to gain more and more of the economic gains because of the rule changes, and I give you a, gave you a small sample, there are many, many others. I have to give you one more. <laughs> I just thought of one that I wanted to share with you, and then I'll get back to my optimism. <laughs> Bankruptcy. Now, some of your eyes just glazed over when I said that. Let me, no, bankruptcy is very interesting and it's very important. Uh, because the rules of bankruptcy, we have a bankruptcy code, and according to the bankruptcy code, if you are a big corporation, if you are uh, a, a certain presidential candidate who has a, allegedly a certain amount of money, you can declare bankruptcy repeatedly and shield your assets from your, the consequences of uh, risks that you take. But if you are for example, say a homeowner who gets caught in the downdraft of a recession, a big recession, and you owe more on your house than the house is worth, you cannot use bankruptcy to reorganize that mortgage debt. Or if you are a former student laden with student debt, I, in Des Moines recently, I, I ran into somebody who was 65 years old and she still had student debts. In fact, her student debts were growing. They weren't shrinking, they were growing because she was behind the curve and she was afraid, she had just heard that her social security was going to be garnished. So why is it that bankruptcy is sort of selective? Why does the bankruptcy code make those kinds of distinctions? Class? <laughs> it's everywhere. So back to my optimism. <laughs> I'm optimistic, number one, because if you look back in American history, what you see repeatedly about every 40 or 50 years is a pattern that Capitalism gets off track. It gets off track in the ways in which we've witnessed. That is, more and more of the gains start going to people at the top. And then you have an upsurge of reform. In the 1830s, the Jacksonians were not against capitalism, they were against aristocracy. And they made many changes in the way corporations can be formed and also in suffrage and very other things. We don't really talk about it anymore. Nobody even remembers what the Jacksonians did. But we do remember the progressives. After that first gilded age of the 1890s, when you had the captains of industry basically running America, putting sacks of money down on the desks of pliant legislators. At the same time, we had extraordinary poverty in our cities, immigrants teeming. We had corruption, we had inequality much, much greater than we have today. Well, what did we do if we were Together, in this hall in 1900, we would sort of be saying, well, there's nothing that can be done, is there? I mean, it's just out of control. The system stinks. We can't save capitalism. Throw it out. But then came 1901, and almost by accident, nobody even assumed that Teddy Roosevelt had anything in him. That's why he was stuck in there as vice president. 
But he became president accidentally, and he didn't lead progressivism. He allowed progressivism to explode. And then again in the 1930s, Teddy's fifth cousin, Franklin. And then for some of us, in the 1960s, I don't know how many of you may remember the 1960s. <laughs> but we had advances in civil rights and in voting rights. And we took seriously our obligation not only to overcome racial segregation, but also to expand the circle of prosperity. And we worked very, very hard. We didn't succeed but we never have succeeded entirely. We made the effort. Medicare, Medicaid, we had huge amounts of poverty among seniors until Medicare and Medicaid. And then in 1970, the Environmental Protection Act. People forget how much energy, how much reformist energy was let loose in the mid-60s up to 1970. What I want to stress with you is that my optimism comes from our history. When things get off track, we put ideology aside, we roll up our sleeves and we get on with what needs to be done. We don't get hung up on false debates about government or market. We don't obsess about false debates, about redistribution after the market has completed its work. We actually start looking at the structure of our economy. And we will do that again. We're already starting. My optimism also comes from a second source, and that is that when I have not been in government, I have been teaching, and I surround myself these days, as I have tried to for many, many years, with people who are aged between 18 and 25, most of them. I defy anybody in this room the possibility of staying cynical when you are surrounded by people who are 18 to 25. Because this current generation, and I don't mean only at the University of California, Berkeley, because I spend time, I was at the University of Texas about a month ago. I was at the University of Chicago two weeks ago. What I find is an idealism and a commitment to public service I have not seen in decades. That also makes me optimistic. And the third reason I'm optimistic is because I don't like the alternative. <laughs> One of the hardest things for any of us to do is to get out of our bubbles. Now, I know Seattle is not in a bubble. <laughs> but Berkeley and San Francisco are sort of in a bubble. You know, I moved uh, 10 years ago. I, I used to be in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I used to teach at another institution whose name shall remain anonymous. Uh, and I, I drove across the country 3,000 miles. And, I, and that, that, that Cambridge, Massachusetts is a bubble. That is a bubble. That's a bubble inside a bubble. And I drove 3,000 miles across the country, and I got to Berkeley. And I discovered that I was in the same bubble. One thing we need to do is to talk to people who disagree with us. That's the only way we learn anything. That's what I tell my students, and it's true. What we'll discover as we start talking across party lines and across ideological lines is that there are degrees of agreement we had not imagined. 
When I drove my, I drove a Mini Cooper actually 10 years ago across the country. I discovered there are no Mini Coopers in Oklahoma. <laughs> Or at least there weren't 10 years ago. I drove, I, I was uh, actually in a gas line in uh, just outside Oklahoma, waiting for gas, and these truckers came up to my Mini Cooper and they tapped on the window. And I put down the window and, and I said, can I help you? And they said, what is this? <laughs> I, I said, it's a Mini Cooper. And then one of them said, how does anybody fit in there? <laughs> I did. I opened the door and I got out and I stood there and I said, no problem. <laughs> and then I said, I'm from Massachusetts. We're all under five feet tall. <laughs> They turned around mumbling something. But we have to get out of our, out of our bubbles. It is critically important. So I wrote Saving Capitalism for the Many, Not the Few, in part as a guidebook for finding how to begin that conversation and what to look for in seeing what I see as that inevitable turning point, that ine inevitable tipping point that we are already in the midst of. Now, one final point I want to make is that populism can take two different forms, and I don't think it is, it is good to get mixed up between the two different forms. One form of populism, and I'll use populism simply as a generic way of expressing a sense that the people need to fundamentally change what is going on, the status quo, the ruling class, One form of populism we have seen historically in the United States in the examples I gave you, let's call reform populism. Reform populism stands for the simple proposition that we've got to make our democracy work. And making it work also makes our economy work. As Louis Brandeis, the Supreme Court Justice, once said, we can have vast wealth in very few hands, or we can have a democracy, but we can't have both. But the second kind of populism that is not as homegrown as the first kind is still lingering historically in America, and it's a very different kind of populism. I call it authoritarian populism. That kind of populism is as angry as reform populism, is as committed to fundamental change as is reform populism, but authoritarian populism is not about democracy. It's about following a strong man who says, don't worry, I will do it. I'm strong enough and big enough and tough enough. I will do it. Don't even ask questions. And by the way, most of your problems are because of them. Authoritarian populism is about scapegoating. Now again, in this country, we have not seen that much. In every, every one of the periods that I suggested to you, there were authoritarian populists around. I remember when I was a boy sitting, watching television. We had a little television. I think it was, the screen was about this big. <laughs> and I remember with, sitting with my father and we were watching the Army McCarthy hearings. Joe McCarthy was sounding off. And I remember my father who was not the kind of person who would explode in anger, 
But I was only about eight years old, I think, or maybe seven years old, and he, sitting next to me, scared me because my father said, son of a bitch. I didn't know what it meant, but it sounded horrible. And he was talking about Joseph McCarthy. And then some of you may remember a man named Joseph Welsh, who said, have you no decency? Have you no shame? And Edward R. Murrow. And the country basically put an end to that kind of, that type of, that brand of authoritarian populism. I bring it up only because it is part of the story we are now in as well. And I don't have to name names. <laughs> Citizenship requires more than voting and paying your taxes and serving on juries. Citizenship requires active participation, active participation. This is what I tell my students. If we're going to have a successful reform populism, it means you have got to be directly involved. In 1936, Franklin D. Roosevelt was running for re-election, and the story goes, a, a, a lady came up to him and said, Mr. President, if you are re-elected, and I will vote for you if you promise to do this and this and this and this and this, and she gave him five things she wanted getting to get done. And he said to her, ma'am, every one of those five things I would like to do, but if I'm re-elected, you must make me. And what he meant was something that I discovered every time I served in Washington. You can have the best people in Washington, but the moneyed interests, even before Citizens United, the moneyed interests and the status quo interests and the special interests will prevent good things from happening unless good th people outside of Washington are mobilized and organized and activated and energized to make sure the good people inside Washington make them happen. It's not a spectator sport. You here in Seattle have accomplished a great deal. I was here about a year ago congratulating you on getting a $15 minimum wage. Not easy. And that was citizen activism. It was moving, organizing, mobilizing. The challenge in front of us is huge. But if history is any guide, we will prevail. Thank you. And now we have time for some questions. Perfect. And so, I hope uh, we have time for answers. Uh, if yes. people want to queue up on either side, just um, keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. Thank you. We've got about 20, 25 minutes. Hello? Okay. <clears throat> um, well, I had originally intended to ask you something on Glass-Steagall, um, but I feel compelled, and I know you can handle diverse subjects. Um, I'd like to ask about war crimes and explicitly that which we've seen with the bombing of the Doctors Without Borders Hospital in Afghanistan. A dozen doctors have perished, other citizens including three children. Uh, and then now the recently released drone papers that go at the crimes around these predator drones where they're saying that at least allegedly a one to ten ratio of targets and civilians that are actually killed in this. And both of the chains of command of both those 
go to the top, to the President of the United States. Well, you have a question. I do have a question for you, and it, it is not whether or not... Uh, I, I'm, no, no, no. Let, 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 me, let me ask the question. Okay, your your I, question I, is... I'd like to ask not whether you think Obama is a war criminal. Uh, you can answer that if you'd like, but I'd rather ask... Wait, hey. Let, let him ask the question. I'd rather ask, why is there, there a complacency amongst people who would have been screaming at Bush and Cheney and now sit back and don't do anything? What is the intellectual and moral complacency that has befallen on those of us that would have gone after somebody like if this had happened with Cheney? Well, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a good and important question about foreign policy under Democrats and why is it that a lot of progressives who would be hollering if Republicans and Republican presidents and Republican administrations did certain things are relatively quiescent? Now, I think that it is not so much quiescence. My interpretation is this, and I want to put it in the context of what I shared with you a moment ago. When we had a draft and almost anybody's children could find themselves in a foreign conflict. We had a degree of citizen activism about foreign policy that I frankly have not seen since. I'm not suggesting necessarily that we bring back the draft, but I am suggesting that we have now a kind of antiseptic foreign policy, one that does not touch us nearly as powerfully, poignantly, and deeply as foreign policy used to teach us and touch us. Uh, it also has to do with class. Look at the people who are actually over there and consider how many people who are families of people over there you know or I know or we know. I think that foreign policy has become something that we are less interested in as a nation. And that is a terrible danger to us. Yes, over here. Okay, this is a similar question. Uh, Alan Greenspan, um, probably most fa famous comment that I can recall was, uh, derivatives are great, they spread the risk, but there's one problem they create a systemic risk. And many, many uh, people are saying that we're looking at either a hyperinflationary blowout or a deflationary blowout. And at the same time... So wait a minute, I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want you to be subjected to the same... <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on. Let me finish my question. That the former questioner was asking. Okay. So, so you okay. want to get to you want to okay. get to your question. Well, here and then at the Democratic Party debate, I was shocked because I saw all five candidates uh, genuflect. Uh, I'll get to the question. Genuflect. No, you have to, to get to the question. Yeah, because otherwise. So the question I have for you is: Do you like the five other Democratic uh, candidates fully support Obama and fully support what he's done? with the Dodd-Frank bill and the TPP and all of that, and would you support him being in office doing that systemic breakdown? No. All right. <laughs> I have a question about those, um, I have a question about those young people that you're surrounded with at Berkeley. Um, and it's about the power of the voting booth, because that's really the only real power we have to uh, basically counteract political power. Um, they, they, the, the millennials voted in droves. And I was actually excited to see this in 2012, but it tailed off in 2014. They weren't the only group that, that, that did not vote as well as 2012. Do you think they'll return to the voting booths in 2016? Uh, generally speaking, as we all know, midterm elections, when you don't have a presidential election, uh, don't attract many people to voting booths. Uh, when you have an incumbent president, you have fewer voters than when you have an open election, as we are facing in 2016. But the interesting underlying question is what is going to get people to vote? Because the long-term trajectory, even in 2008 or the year 2000, is we have had fewer and fewer people voting. 
Why are they not voting? I think it has to do with a general sense of cynicism. They don't feel like their votes matter. And cynicism, again, is our greatest obstacle to effective change. Now, part of it is voter suppression. Part of it also is gerrymandering. Part of it is, I mean, there are other things that are going on as well. But I believe that the candidate who is going to win in 2016 is the candidate who engenders the most enthusiasm in terms of actually people getting off their fannies and working, not just going to the voting booth, but actually working. And that's why I am, and I'm not going to say who I'm for, <laughs> because I, wait a minute, I, I, You know, I, this is another factoid that I would la ask you to keep within this room. Uh, I had a date with Hillary Rodham before she was married, when she was Hillary Rodham. I, when we were in college, we went out, just one date. I forgot about this until the 2008 election when I got a call from a New York Times reporter saying that we have found a stack of her letters from college when she was at Wellesley, and she mentions that she went out on a date with you. And then the reporter asked, is there anything that you can remember from that date that might shed light on how she would perform as president? And I, I didn't know what to say. I barely remembered the date. And so with my tongue firmly planted in my cheek, I said, well, all I remember is she wanted an inordinate amount of butter on her popcorn. <laughs> and then there was silence. And I thought he'd hung up. I said, hello, are you still there? He said, I'm just writing all this down. <laughs> but I also have known Bernie Sanders not as long as that. I didn't ever go out on a date with him. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm a great admirer of him, uh, of his. I just, I think that he has brought to this election uh, a truth about the structure of the economy, such as I've been talking about, that people need to hear and want to hear. And that is why, even though he's not getting big dollars, and he's rejected big dollars, he is closing the funding gap. And when I looked just before I came over here tonight to find out whether Joe Biden had entered the race, I still don't know. <laughs> I, I know Joe Biden fairly well. I've worked with him. I want to declare very clearly for you all that I will not vote for a Republican for president. Now, now it, that doesn't mean I will never. It just means of this particular group, I cannot find one who I consider to be sane. I, I don't, that, that may be, you know, that may be, that's, you just wanted my opinion, right? I've now given you everything I have. Yes. Uh, Did I miss you? Yeah, okay. While I was working for uh, U.S. Senator Patty Murray in Washington, D.C., I too ran the signature machine for, for Patty Murray. How uh, long also did you do really that? How many, how many months? I did it for about six months, but it was not six totally, months? I mean, a full-time job there as a staff assistant, oh. legislative assistant, but I did didn't Did you write any letters day. to your friends? Yeah, but, and then I learned how to write it with my own hand, so I didn't oh. got to give up the machine, but 
Uh, I was actually fortunate enough to stand on the Senate floor as NAFTA was being adopted, actually when the Senate vote came, and uh, I was proud and excited, and um, it seemed like one of the great things is it was in some ways helping Mexico, it's helping Canada, and I think it looks like we have a, or they have a new uh, leader in Canada, by the way, I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> Justin Trudeau. Uh, but my question is, what is it about TPP that is so much more vile to a lot of people than NAFTA was? And I, and it's, I say that I suppose somewhat out of ignorance. But. Well, I'll tell you why I think, uh, I, I always had, and I'll be very candid with you, inside the administration I had a lot of problems with NAFTA because I didn't think that the labor protections were strong enough. Uh, but when you're inside administration, you have a choice. You can either work inside and make the best case you can inside and try to argue the administration's position outside or you can leave. And I made that choice. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, though, is a much bigger problem. And that problem has to do with two things, both of which I've touched on a little bit tonight. One has to do with intellectual property. From what has been leaked, and I say what has been leaked, we don't know, and it were not for the leaks and WikiLeaks, we would not have any clue what is in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But from what's been leaked, we know that it gives the pharmaceutical industry even more intellectual property protection, internationally and even arguably inside the United States. Secondly, it creates something that was just a little bit of a, an acorn in NAFTA, but really has become a huge, giant oak tree that is very threatening in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and that is a special panel that is outside the jurisdiction of any individual nation that allows global companies to assert that their profits have been hurt by health, safety, environmental, or even labor legislation that has been passed in any particular country, and in that panel get damages against that country for those health, safety, environmental, or labor regulations. Mm -hmm. Now, I consider that very dangerous. I rest my case. Yes. Hi, Robert. You may remember last year I came with my son and he asked if he could come this year. My daughter asked if she could come. Hi. She wanted to know if uh, we should have teachers move up with students each year so they get to know their students better so that they can learn better. That's your question. That's her question. That's a great question. My question was similar that um, our family has gone through exactly what you describe. Um, bankruptcy that um, kept us from being able to keep our home and all of my student debt still remains, even as a high school science teacher. And one of the concerns that I have is not just the redistribution of wealth upward, but the fact that with zero interest rates, major corporations and their major stockholders are simply buying back their, their shares and consolidating their position. It's worse than that. I know. That's the part it's that really I'm most concerned with. But, uh, um, but let, me, let, let, me, let me answer, first of all, answer your question, <laughs> which is a great question. Should the teachers move up with students from grade to grade? If you love your teacher and your teacher, he or she is a great teacher, that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, but maybe if you don't... <laughs> you see, you've got to be a little careful about these ideas. Um, in terms of uh, teaching generally, and you are a teacher, That's and it. I want to salute you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, one thing that worries me a little bit about this, uh, this mood of scapegoating we're in is that we are even scapegoating our teachers where what we ought to be doing is honoring them and respecting them and putting them on a pedestal they deserve. Thank you. Uh, 
bankruptcy. You wanted to talk about bankruptcy, and I, but I don't remember your question because I um, just, was so overwhelmed with all of the questions. Um, just the fact that it is, it is so impossible for someone who is caught in the mess to be able to get out of it. Yeah, it's right? hard because the, the compounding of the interest itself, this 65-year-old this that I met recently who told me that she was going to be garnished, she was afraid that her Social Security checks were going to be garnished, she had more debt now than she had before, even though she was making more payments. We're now in that, the same spot. We're in the same that spot. Is, that is ludicrous. Yes. Again, go back. Play the tape back, you don't remember. But in the 1960s, we had public universities where the tuition, I know it's a little boring. It's actually, this is important just for fine. you. When the tuition was zero. Right. You know, the great movement we had in the 50s and 60s to establish free public higher education was seen as an extension of our K through 12 movement for free public education. And we have completely lost sight of that. This makes it very difficult to motivate my students when they don't really see any possibility of a future beyond their condition. Well, it's going to be changed. Okay. Yes. Just giving you a heads up, we only have time for a couple more questions. We have two more? Two more, yes, thank you. Two more questions. Uh, speaking of the rules, I also wanted to ask you about uh, TPP. As I understand it, earlier this year you expressed the opinion that the Trans-Pacific Partnership was very nearly dead. I wanted to ask if you are still of that opinion, and if not, um, what can we do about it? Well, I keep thinking it's dead. And then it's like a, one of those monsters that keeps on opening its eyes again. Uh, I. Uh, I thought it was dead originally. I didn't think that there was going to be fast track. There was huge opposition to fast track. And then it was cobbled together, enough votes to get fast track. And then I thought it was dead because uh, a lot of the signatories didn't like it. Uh, and then it has got back to the vote. There are 90 days. Congress has 90 days. Once it gets a final copy, essentially, of that treaty, 90 days to decide on it. I still believe it unlikely that there are going to be enough votes for it. Hillary Clinton coming out against it, I don't care whether she was sincere or insincere, she took the rug out from under uh, Barack Obama and the Republicans. And the Republicans are in such disarray in any event. Uh, I don't think that that Congress is capable of doing anything. So I which I ordinarily would say is not, you know, is a mixed blessing, but in this case, I think it is a very important blessing. So I, I, let them know. Let, let your members of Congress know exactly how you feel. And if you have any relatives or friends in Nebraska, Oklahoma, Iowa, <laughs> Ohio, do you? Yes. Well, talk to them and make sure they also register their views. Yes, this is the last question, and I... Uh, it better be a great question. All right. I don't, I don't, want, I don't, want, to, I don't want to put any pressure on you at all. All right. Dr. But Wright? I would like a question that allows me to summarize... Mm -hmm. All right. With a, with, a, with, a, ...with a great kind of exhortation. Beautiful. I hope to give you that question. So, Dr. Reich, I'm glad to hear that you're optimistic. But when I look back at the historical record, FDR was talking about a second Bill of Rights in 1945. If you go back and read the words of Martin Luther King Jr. in a 1966 leadership retreat, he said, and I quote, there is something wrong with capitalism. It is time for America to move towards a democratic socialism. I believe in the right, and this is not an exact quote, but it's pretty close, of a guaranteed universal basic income. We live in a time where technology is creating more and more uh, automation where more and more people will be put out of jobs by programmers until programmers put themselves out of jobs. That's just the way the world is going. Do we really need capitalism? It isn't a universal basic income. Isn't a universal <laughs> job. <laughs> now listen, listen, listen to me. First of all, I want to give that to you. 
Thank you. Now, let me say something else. The last two chapters in that book make the case for a universal basic income. Woo! All right? Is that still capitalism? Okay. But, but the reason I don't call it democratic socialism is that even countries like Denmark and Sweden and Norway that are arguably democratic socialist, they are still capitalist in the sense that their basic economic structure is private property, the free exchange of and voluntary exchange of goods and services. Even communist China is becoming more and more capitalist. So instead of what I really want us to get to, instead of talking about the isms, mm. ask the fundamental question, which is, is this system working for all of us giving us all a fair shot, or is the system biased in some very important structural ways? And if it's biased, how exactly do we unrig that system? Okay. Now, so. it will explain it. This, mm -hmm. this. <laughs> so Bill Maher had a great conversation with Bernie Sanders about this, right? Bill Maher challenged Bernie and he said, listen, I think the biggest problem with your campaign is that you say you're a socialist. 48% of Americans, more people would vote for gay people and black people than would vote for a socialist. Maybe, it seems to me that your answer is as well saying that we want to stay away from the isms because yes, they're I, scary words. They're scary unnecessarily. And I have been an informal advisor uh, to the Bernie Sanders campaign, and as recently as yesterday, as recently as yesterday, I made it very clear that I thought it was not helpful <laughs> to talk about democratic socialism. So, but but wait a minute, saying, but, I, but, 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 the, but your point is, is... Isn't it time for progressives to be loud and proud about saying, we do believe? in a universal basic income. We do believe we do, in... We do believe. These principles well, we do believe, of democratic socialism. We do believe in a system that works for all of us. Exactly. We don't believe in an oligarchy. We don't believe in an aristocracy. Mm -hmm. We don't believe that there should be people called the working poor mm -hmm. who are working full-time and poor. Right. We don't believe that there should be non-working rich in right. as much, many people as... And, and we, believe, we believe not in pure equality, that's silly, but we believe that we should have a system in which everyone has a chance, a real chance to make it, and everybody moves upward as the economy improves. Right. That CEOs making 300 times the average worker salary is absurd. Right. And, and we could go on with what we believe, but we believe fundamentally that there is a moral core mm -hmm. of the system whatever you want to call the system. That's what I think Bernie Sanders is doing, because if you look at the, if you look at the Reagan revolution, if you look at the way the neoconservatives have changed... Hand me the book back. ...the way we talk <laughs> about these concepts, why can't we own these concepts? Why can't yes, we yes. say okay, I we think want to that be we would like to sum this conversation wait, wait, wait. up. Wait, on. wait, wait. I was just about to bring this to a close with a great crescendo. Please. And that's the... <laughs> the vast majority of the nation's citizens do have the power to alter the rules of the market to meet their needs. But to exercise that power, we must understand what's happening and where our interests lie, and we must join together. We've done so before. If history is any guide and common sense has any sway, we will do so again in ways that I outline. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.